Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're going to talk about helping the unsheltered get undercover and how different organizations are involved in that whole process with our special guest, Elizabeth Funk, founder and CEO of Dignity Moves, which collaborates with others to provide interim housing. Eric Solvan, City of San Jose's Housing Director, and Cupid Alexander, who is the Deputy Director for the City of San Jose, and Adrian Covert, Bay Area Council's Senior Vice President of Public Policy. The Bay Area Council is a nonpartisan problem-solving nonprofit that brings business, government, and civic leaders together to solve big issues. Thank you so much for being here. It is just wonderful, wonderful to have you here. And I'd like to, to start with you, Elizabeth, uh, because unsheltered is a problem for us all. It's a it's a problem for every person who is walking along a pavement and is tr and sees a fellow human being who is uh, sitting or lying there, a family uh, without any shelter, uh, driving past homeless uh, encampments. It's a problem for every business. It's a problem for us all. So let's talk a little bit about how you deal with this with this issue, how you have developed an, a nonprofit that creates a rapid response capability. And then we'll go to Eric and Cupid and then Adrian, if, if, if we can wind up in our intro uh, segment on the work of the Bay Area Council to focus on this. But Elizabeth, let's let's take it away. Thanks, Mark. And you're correct to make the distinction that unsheltered homelessness is just one component of a much bigger and more complex issue called homelessness and the housing crisis. I think a lot of people don't understand that those are not synonymous. But unsheltered homelessness is the most visible. It's the most inhumane. And it is the one part of a very complex problem that can be solved. So we're never going to be able to prevent tragic loss of jobs or loss of families um, and people falling on hard times. But we can prevent that from becoming what we call chronic homeless. The condition known as chronically homeless, where you've been on the streets cumulative for more than a year and you're suffering from debilitating conditions, that's unacceptable in today's society. And so the idea is that we, you're exactly right, a surgical intervention, a quick intervention where when people first become homeless, if they have a place they can go, even if it's not their permanent solution, it's something. And they can plug in their cell phone and they can shower, they can sleep, they can cry, they can take a deep breath, and then they can start thinking about future solutions. And the reality is we'd love for people when they first become homeless to be able to get right back on their feet into permanent housing. But the reality is that is costing so much money and taking so long. And with zoning, there's not even enough space to do it all right away. That the reality is if we hold out and expect people to only move into permanent housing, for every one person who's exiting the system into that, three or four are falling into homelessness. And so we've got to have an alternative plan. But the thing that's most heartening to me is that when people first become homeless, the vast majority of them do not yet have a debilitating enough condition of mental health or behavioral health to prevent them from returning to stability. It's being on the streets that's causing that. And that's what we need to prevent. And so the it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting dichotomy because of course, only permanent housing ends homelessness. And we get a lot of pushback that spending money on something that's temporary isn't a long-term solution. And yet I think of it as prevention. It's prevention of needing a permanently supported place for the rest of their lives. And it is an investment that's worth making. And it's been unfortunately pitted as sort of an either or strategy of we're either gonna focus our resources on permanent solutions or we're gonna squander them on interim housing. And I really think that they're that they're one. It's one continuum. It's one continuum. And I well, think and, and doesn't public yeah. d doesn't common sense require these various approaches, Eric? You know, I I look at this as if 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 I'm starving, and somebody gives me a packet of seeds, and says, "Here, you can fix your your, your problem with hunger. Here are some seeds." What am I going to do? I'm starving today. I, by the time those those seeds get planted and watered and grow, I'm done. Right? Is is that how you see it? And and I know that you and Cupid are are always looking at budget and how the the, the dollars can be spent best. How do you see it from your perspective? 
at the city of San Jose. Well, I think the framing of the issue is spot on, which is how do we address immediate needs in order to mitigate what is an inhumane experience of being unsheltered uh, in San Jose, throughout the country, and, and a lot of major cities throughout the world. So where do we find more immediacy of solutions that can provide that bridge on the housing continuum to then stabilize individuals and provide some more temporary housing that then creates a pathway towards more permanent housing options. You know, particularly within San Jose, you know, your time period from initial pre-development to actual occupancy for permanent supportive housing is roughly three and a half to four years. In that time, you can have a lot more individuals enter the experience of homelessness. Therefore, we have to find more creative points of intervention on the housing continuum in order to ensure that we can mitigate those who are unsheltered, providing a temporary option, as well as wraparound services, and begin building that bridge to more permanent housing. And then two, where do we as cities expand our public-private partnerships in order to fund both capital and operating sides of those interventions? And Cupid, I'm going to come to you in a, in a bit because you have some really interesting experience in different municipalities in Houston, in in uh, Austin, um, in in uh, in municipalities in Oregon. But uh, before I come back to you, Cupid, um, Adrian, talk a little bit about how the Bay Area Council views the problem and and this intersectionality that we were discussing before the show between the mental health issues that Elizabeth raised and homelessness and why you think that this sort of immediate response is so important? Well, I think this is really a math problem. And the way we look at this is this is a math problem. This is a numbers problem. California has 40 homeless residents for every 10,000 residents overall. That's the third highest in the United States. Now, the other states that are higher than it, New York in particular, doesn't seem to seem to, to have the same crisis of folks dying and uh, uh, struggling on the streets in the same visceral way that California has. And that's because in California, we take a, our bad problem and we make it worse by providing just 39 shelter beds for every 100 homeless individuals. New York, it's about 100 to 100. In California, it's 39 for every 100. That's the 49th lowest in the United States. So in California, you're very likely to, you're more likely to become homeless here than in almost any other state. And when you do, you're more likely to be on the streets. Uh, that is a sentence to the streets. Um, the only other state that has fewer shelters per capita than us is Oregon, uh, our, our neighbor, which is struggling with the same issues, and they're barely ahead of us with 38 beds per 100. So to what Elizabeth was talking about um, on the expense side, you know, for the past 20 years, we've been focusing, focusing, focusing on permanent housing, permanent housing, permanent housing. And so have other states in the United States. And in a lot of low cost, low rates of homelessness states, that approach has worked really well over the past 20 years. The problem in California is that the average cost of a new permanent supportive housing unit in certain metro areas can be near a million dollars. The statewide average is about $650,000 a unit. And so we have now run the experiment with the state's investments uh, over the past five years of nearly $20 billion in homelessness spending. We cannot build permanent housing faster than the rate at which our broken housing market is creating homeless people. So we've invested this money and the problem has just grown. Our homeless population has, has, has continued to grow. So what do we do? I think what we have to do is one, you have to stem the bleeding by building more housing supply, build more housing supply and bring the cost of housing down and stop the inflow of people out onto the streets bring us at least more in line with the national average. That has to be number one. But that's going to take a long time to correct a housing market like this. It's going to take at least a decade. So you've got 120,000 people on the streets right now. We know that shelter is a basic human need without which people are murdered at tragically high rates. They die accidentally of, at tragically high rates. A woman, unsheltered woman, less than a mile from my house was murdered last month um camping alongside the creek uh the bay area lost 20 homeless people last winter 
just from the elements, from trees falling on tents, from bitter cold, from winter storms. All of this is preventable. We just need to provide the shelter and we can have the resource. We do have the resources to do that. The fact that we are prioritizing to not do that and let people stay on the streets where they're traumatized until they have a psychological disorder or a substance use disorder is unacceptable, morally, ethically, it shouldn't be allowed. So that's why we're focusing on bringing people indoors and saving lives. Adrian, I'm gonna go to Cupid now. I I want Elizabeth to start unpacking the model. Uh, Cupid, uh, you've you've lived all across the country and you've, you've dealt with these issues in different states. Um, Adrian mentioned um, Oregon. Um, you, you've, you've dealt with these issues in Oregon. You've dealt with these issues in Houston. You've dealt with these issues in, in Austin. Um, are, are the issues palpably different? I know there are different scales based on you know, each of the states' uh, spending and, and their own dynamics, but are these issues that that we find in every municipality in the United States, or is this something that is reserved for just a few areas? Yeah, thanks for that question, Mark. I think the the uniting theme is that homelessness is a, a national issue. I think what is different is that every part of it is a little bit local. Like they say, all politics are local, real estate is local, our response has to be local. So you can't necessarily compare San Jose to where Eric is from, Philly, or you can't compare San Jose to the response in Houston. Houston had a lot of land, right? So they had the ability to develop. I think the conversation that we're having is what are the local responses we can have in the Bay Area to utilize the spaces that we have to create solutions and look at the hard numbers? Because even from my perspective, we're looking at the acuity levels. And Elizabeth mentioned this, the longer that you're unhoused, the lower the acuity level, the harder it is to get you housed. So what can we have as an upstream solution to not only keep you housed, but rapidly rehouse you. So as we continue with this conversation, I know my director, Eric, has been looking at how do we get to functional zero? How do we scale up our ability to rapidly respond? What are the options that we have so we can uh, bravely address these issues? So are you daring to say that we sometimes allow politics to get in the way of actually just taking practical action and just sort of focusing on our I'm no politician. Oh, my I'm a, I'm a humble practitioner. So with that, I say, you know, my job under Eric's leadership is to take the resources that we have and make the partnerships that we have and use the intelligence that we have to exponentially create solutions within the space we have. And I leave the politics to the politicians. <laughs> That's great. Elizabeth, let's let's unpack the model because the model is fabulous, right? I walk by vacant lots every day. Any city, doesn't matter, East Coast, West Coast, center of the country, there are vacant lots everywhere. There are also homeless people in every place that I visit. Every place. Talk about your model and how you take these resources in cooperation with the business community, in cooperation with municipalities to start addressing this. But not only start, but you get to a solution fast, don't you? Yes, we do. And I think, you know, where we start is saying, okay, the imperative is to have places for people to go that are safe and dignified, where people are willing to go. First of all, we need to keep that in mind that they need to be appealing to the person's individual needs. But we look at it and we say, well, why are people not indoors? Well, first of all, because they want to have their own space. They that's the dignity. And if you think about it, like not having a place to like take a deep breath and be alone, you can't imagine that that's helping psychologically. And so and so, okay, people need to have their own room. So that's fundamental number one. So we'll have little cabins where people can have their own room. But then how are we going to build a bunch of these? It, land is so expensive. Okay, we'll borrow land. Because as you say, there's land out there everywhere that somebody's got a project planned in the future or the government uh, yes. might want to plan a library someday. And so there's land that's not available for sale and yet not currently being used. And every day that land sits vacant is a squandered resource. And so we can convert that squandered resource into something that's productive, provided that they are truly relocatable. And right now is sort of the week around Burning Man. And I think about the uh, the analogy there, it's leave no trace, right? They come in and they set up a, a mega city for 8,000 people, and then it's gone a week later. And that's really you know the kind of thing that if we're thinking that way, there's no reason that housing can't be built really quickly and then relocatable. And so 
We, of course, building codes are very onerous, but this is an emergency. So we can use emergency building codes. Cities and counties and states have all declared some sort of crisis around housing. So we use emergency building codes that are absolutely sufficient for life safety, but they are not all of the additional reach codes that would be appropriate if we're worried about the long term impact of, you know, the environmental sustainability of, you know, ratio of electric vehicle chargers to parking, all that kind of nonsense. Not so nonsense. If, I'm a, if I'm a landowner and I have that lot and I want to develop it and it's I'm going through the permitting and, and Eric, you mentioned, you know, five years, six years to get permits and so on. So I've got I've got this asset. It's underutilized. Meanwhile, I've got I've got a chain link fence. There's no security. Perhaps there are. Um, homeless folks who are trying to find a little space of their own and perhaps they're breaking through my fence and so on. I mean, for me, there's <laughs> why can't I be part of a solution, right, Adrian? I mean, we can just, you could, you can just sort of see community coming together. And Elizabeth, you actually facilitate, to me, the art here is you're facilitating these agreements amongst these different players. Well, I think that's right. And think about it there. You know, it sounds obvious. And yet for a private landowner, it isn't. They worry about liability. They worry about optics. They worry about all sorts of things. And so it does take a facilitation. And quite frankly, with San Jose being an exception, not a lot of cities are out there actively making these asks and talking to landowners about building interim housing because they're not bought into the model in general. So Dignity Moves plays that middle person where we're out talking to landowners and making a pitch. By the way, they can have their property taxes exempt or waived potentially, depending on the local jurisdiction for being for letting the land be used for this purpose. But they certainly a lot of them are paying every week. They pay somebody to go clear off the encampments to keep their land safe. Well, we can save them that money. Right. And then the other thing that we can do and San Jose has been a leader in this as well is that we prioritize housing placements to the people in that immediate area. So that neighborhood is the one that sees the benefit. And if I'm going to be really cynical and I'm a commercial real estate developer, I want my five square blocks to be the one that doesn't have anybody sleeping there. So there's a value to them um, as, as well as being doing the right thing. That's, that's very interesting. Eric, could you comment on that? This whole idea of taking sections of the city that uh, that that might have a lot of vacant lots. They might have might have closed down businesses or had old factories. You know, have have gone sort of uh, brownstone. Right. It's 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 not being utilized. Is this part of of San Jose's strategy, not to solve homelessness, which it which is is part of this, but it's also to revitalize certain neighborhoods and also create a pathway for those people who are temporarily housed to get into more permanent solutions. Is that is that part of what's going on here? Yes, and that's part of the intent here is where do we get more community involvement in creating localized, I would say micro level city solutions in these neighborhoods to say, how do we address our encampment issues? Where do we create more shelter beds on an interim basis that are faster to stand up so we can transition encampments to more managed, decent, safe spaces? And, and then in those decent, safe spaces, connect them to services that provide a bridge back to more permanent housing. And I think part of the strategy here is where do we look at those interventions on a sort of community by community level throughout the city to ensure we're creating a balanced approach throughout the city while also meeting the needs of those who are on house in those immediate areas. I'm wondering, can this be taken to greater DC? Can this be taken to Baltimore? Can this model be taken to Denver? And this model be taken to Bentonville, Arkansas. Absolutely. Right, is there any impediment that any? Go ahead, Adrian. You know, the, the funny thing. One, the short answer is absolutely. You know, there's vacant land in every city in the United States. Um, so yes, it, it absolutely can. But it's funny that you mentioned Arkansas because you know Arkansas has one of the lowest rates of homelessness in the United States. About five. Arkansans are homeless for every 10,000. Um, and it's not because they've invented some extraordinarily cutting edge progressive policy to end homelessness in Arkansas that, or, or in West Virginia or in Mississippi or in all the other states 
where homelessness is the lowest in the United States, which happened to be in some of the states with the highest rates of poverty in the United States. It's because they allow housing to be built near demand. So that's, you know, this, a lot of this conversation uh, comes down to or, or falls into how can the government intervene? How can philanthropy intervene? How can we intervene? The first step is to do no harm. And on that note, because in places like California, if you're doing too much harm, then there's no amount of intervention that is going to solve the problem for you. Um, you're you're going to continuously be uh, digging yourself out of a hole that continues to get deeper as you go, and you're going to continue to run in place. So you mentioned other states. Yes, ending unsheltered homelessness and addressing it and bringing people in swiftly uh, and affordably um, and stabilizing people, this can go anywhere. But let's take a moment to appreciate why this is more important to do in some states versus others. Uh, and that just comes down to how much housing we allow to get built there. And I think you're making a very good point, which is that anytime any um, group of people become self-satisfied with how they function, they can just look at their neighbor at, who functions a little bit differently and see that there are different solutions that are being implemented that we can learn from, right? So somebody from Arkansas can learn from California, somebody from California can learn from Arkansas, and it actually can, can help the country be stronger, right? We just need to talk with each other and learn from each other, right? Absolutely. So when you were knitting together this solution, Elizabeth, and, and Akiba, I'd love for you to jump in, because you you have all these different experiences, Eric. You're from Philadelphia. When you look at these at these components of the of, of Elizabeth's solution, do you see components that in your previous roles in Philadelphia or in Houston or whatever that these components could find purchase? And should Elizabeth be out there helping others to learn from from the experiences that you are collectively transforming into value for homeless people, right? Can, can those elements be adopted and exported in a way that honors Adrian's point that, that adjusts the model to each of those different municipalities? Eric, you want to you just weigh in and then let's just, let's just uh, dogpile on this issue. Yeah, absolutely. So I can speak to, you know, the work being done in Denver, uh, where they're looking to find quick bill, quick lease up solutions. This can certainly work there. Uh, having worked in Denver, no shortage of open lands that have future development plans that have never kind of materialized or the materialization date is too far out. And then you go to the East Coast side, where do you look at options? Uh, like in, you mentioned Baltimore and DC and also add Philadelphia to that mix of unused parcels throughout the city where we can provide a temporary solution that's then integrated to the continuation of that individual down the housing continuum. So it is a idea that is, more broadly applicable, you know, and Cupid can kind of talk through some of the work he's done in other spaces and where we can kind of micro target some of those populations kind of we're looking to serve with the idea. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. And I think that even though I would love Elizabeth to stay and focus all of her efforts here in San Jose with us, I think the thing that's connecting, we, we Eric and I talk about this build by borrow methodology around how you build up housing. And I think that in areas that are urban and dense and high cost, knowing how to partner with an entity to create these solutions locally is probably the biggest benefit that I could see because it allows those to have an anti-displacement, trauma-informed, um, universal operations kind of methodology that says, hey, even when I, Eric and I checked out what Dignity Moves was doing in downtown San Francisco, the beautiful thing is that the individuals who are there were also a part of the system of keep, keeping the community safe. Um, and it does, it allows you to feel like you're a human being that is in the community and it's happening with you and not to you. So I think that those, that methodology is something that would resonate a lot of different places. 
So it's not this us versus them mentality, but it's a model that allows individuals to be a part of a shared solution and it allows them to be uh, localized to stay in their community. And I think that that's a part of getting to the heart. If we're going to change from the numbers and start talking about the heart of this work and improving the quality of life of individuals, I think this model centers the individuals um, to say that the solution is meant to improve your quality of life. And so that's one of the benefits that I see, because a lot of times we talk about the numbers and we talk about the the space, but we forget the people and we do it for the people. So I think as we've looked at this work, one of the things that I've seen is not only looking at those numbers, but improving the quality of life, improving the quality of the housing. Um, one of the things that Eric has been looking at, and I appreciate him for this, is the sustainability of our housing and how do we link it to other systems to make it um, a model that's operational that we can fund with resources that we have. So I think that those things are the parts that I think are transferable. Mark, I'll jump in on the national expansion thing because this is, I kind of laughed. I thought maybe you'd already gotten the clip. Well, this is why, this is one of the reasons we're here, right? I mean, so we, we were talking this about Denver. We recruited Britta Fisher, to, who runs the um, the uh, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, right? This mm. When we work around the country, we actually see the opportunity and one of the reasons we're here is to just sort of have a dialogue around around these elements that that uh, you've invented, Elizabeth, with your partners. Uh, take it away. Yeah. Well, so first of all, um, unfortunately, unsheltered homelessness is is really uniquely a California problem. Fifty percent of the unsheltered in our nation are in California, and so it's disproportionately a California problem. That means that any solutions that we have here are, you know, are, are then going to be able to be shared in other in other regions, just like so much in California gets shared elsewhere. And while we started our work here in California, um, we are now. That's why I was laughing if this was kind of the, the punchline, which is that we have just now started the process of thinking about our a rollout nationally. And that wouldn't necessarily be us as the developers. Because Dignity Moves is not a developer per se. We are about promoting strategies for getting everyone indoors right away. And one of the ways we do that is we'll happy to develop the community for you if you need us to. But we're about sharing this mantra and catalyzing the end of unsheltered homelessness and catalyzing being the word for it. And so we're working on a playbook, for instance, and we've got a grant now to start thinking about hiring nationally um, advocates and liaisons and, and all of that sort of thing. And, and we certainly, our partners from a functional perspective, Gensler and Swinerton are national firms. So there's no reason we can't be the ones that actually develop in Denver, but it's not binary. We're happy to just spread the, spread the knowledge and spare it spread the mission and the how-to and hope to see this. It's one of the things that really strikes me about uh, working with you, Elizabeth, is that is the generosity and the willingness to listen that people have other elements of the solution. Um, you know, we, we visited one of, one, of your, um, one of your installations and we interacted with the people who were providing security we interacted with some of the mental health folks and there were different people from different organizations all coming together, doing their thing to solve this common problem that we all have. That's how the country should function, isn't it? It's an all hands on deck problem. It affects all of us and it takes all of us and including the private sector, where I think, unfortunately, it's been fairly binary where philanthropy has chipped away at things here and there and then government is doing what government does in bulk. And the missing part is the over, the intersection of those two. There's much more opportunity for philanthropy to have a really meaningful role, both in terms of quantity of dollars, but also a lot of things the private sector can do better or more agilely than the public sector and vice versa. And we really need to be going into this instead of so many people complain that the city hasn't solved the problem. Well, instead of complaining, like be part of it, right? It takes all of us and, and there are important roles. So Dignity Moves spends a lot of time thinking about how we can catalyze bringing the private sector to bear, even though it's government's responsibility to solve it, it's everyone's responsibility. Well, let's leave the, the, the conversation on, on this note, and we'll do it again uh, sometime, bringing together uh, um, you and, and others to, to continue to talk about this. I want to thank you all for every contribution that you make. And I want to point out one thing that is very clear to me sitting you know, on this side of the table and also having interacted with you and your colleagues over the years. It starts with recognizing the person as a person. 
That person who is homelessness is you, is me. That person wants to have some privacy. They want to have agency. They demand it, right? And if they have difficulties, they also want to have a certain amount of independence. So this is not a big brother kind of a situation or where one group is telling another group how they need to live their lives. It's a matter of us all coming at this with a certain respect and shaping solutions that are imbued with that type of respect. I want to thank you all for making that point in different ways. It's so, so important. Elizabeth Funk, founder and CEO of Dignity Moves, Eric Solang and uh, Cupid Alexander, the city of San Jose. Uh, your housing department is amazing. Adrian Covert, Bay Area Council, Senior Vice President of Public Policy. I want to thank you all for your part in this solution and for helping to uh, inform us through sharing your insights with us. Great. Thank, thank you. you, Mark. Thank you, Mark.